Hello, this is Colin Day, Managing Director of Octopost and host of Octopost Discussion Series, The Globalization of Social Media. Welcome on to the discussion. Today, Thursday, April the 2nd, 2020, we're joined by Carl Hegarty, author of The Accidental Business Nomad, an insider's guide to working globally during times of uncertainty. Carl is also the Managing Director of the TheLeadershipNomad.com, where he's helping companies and teams evolve to face the growing global communication and collaboration challenges in a world that is more digitally connected today than ever before. Hello, mate. I've just got a bunch of people having early dinner and they're going out to play. You strike me as the perfect guy to do this type of stuff. So I, I, oh, I'll uh, have to oh, really? tune in. And, and I've got, I've got, um, you know, I've ah. got your uh, your book cover. So the the book is titled "The Accidental um, Business Nomad." Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, and and you've got in that nice little slack um, red box on that cover, right? A survival guide for working across um, a shrinking planet. That's why I had to have you on this podcast. Right? <laughs> was, was that alone because the planet has just shrunk considerably right airlines are, are no longer flying we're, we're relying on technology to communicate look I, I think that the the argument that i was making in the book and the book was of course written before this most recent explosion of uh pandemic kicked in um but the argument that i was making that from a digital is i'm uh, sorry from a globalization standpoint we've we've come to a point where there's all sorts of uh issues and fighting and arguments is globalization dead is it dying is this pandemic going to end globalization and my big argument is that it's actually not at all it, it it's digital uh, globalization has just gone more digital than anything and and you and i this conversation is exhibit a of that uh, the reason why it's called the accidental business nomad is because people whether they wanted to or not, are finding that they're working globally. Uh, they're working remotely. It happened by accident. This wasn't by plan. And so the entire uh, setup, I think, is one that we're all now finding that we're in, but nobody's been prepped or trained for this. So then what we looked at or what I've been thinking about is, you know, I, I, I moved to the other side of the planet. And most of the work that I've done for the last 14, 15 years has been global in nature. So what have I learned? And, and most of the stuff that are lessons come from all the screw ups, uh, from the, you know, from the okay kids to fail, up. right? Yep. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I, I think that one of, so, so I, I, there's a lot of failure stories in this thing. Um, and I think that one of the biggest failures that companies have made is the failure to be willing to tell those failure stories. Uh, what I mean by that is that there's a lot of people that work globally, work in global teams, uh, work remotely. They have all these issues, but they don't really talk about the underlying problems and, and how it gets fixed. So the same mistakes get repeated over and over again. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, you've, you've spent yeah. your, your career, right? You said the last 14 years, but you know, you spent your career really helping optimize global teams in times of uncertainty, right? And there's no more uncertainty than, yeah. than there is now, right? It, this is a, this is a good, uh, good exhibit of uh, our good old VUCA, you know, volatile, uncertain, right? So yep. Uh, yep. we're, we're, we're this is probably as uh, hopefully as bad as it gets, but, but we'll, you know, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that, look, I think there's been a lot of disruption in industries in the last 20 years, certainly since, since we've been involved in this, uh, a lot of it's been very positive, but it does come with creative destruction along the way. So this is not, you know, I, I'm, I'm not um, the, the big flag bearer saying all globalization is great. I, I I'm taking more of an agnostic view saying I, I'm not going to say if it's good or bad. I'm just saying that this is what I have to deal with. I don't know about you, but I'm working globally every single day. Uh, and so let's now look at, you know, what are those obstacles that are getting in, in my way? Uh, and, and one of the big things that keeps coming up for me is the culture. 
It's, it's the culture right. side, which, uh, you know, I, talking to someone from the UK, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're like an alien. Let's be honest. Hey, that's only that's only because uh, you speak American English, right? It's either English or it's American. Come on, it can't be both. I've been I've been I've been married uh, and living with a British woman for the last 14, 15 years, and I'm still I you know I'm just just welcome to, to the club. Out, just figuring it's, it out. Really? So we can't make you an honorary Brit at the moment? Then you're not into I, HP I, sauce and. Uh, I got to um, I got to go to the um, uh, uh, I was at some cricket over the summer so that was that was pretty pretty British. Yes, I'm it's drinking, just like at five p.m. I'm drinking tea. Hey, look, it's just like um, baseball, but with a, a bat that's been run over by a, a, a truck. <laughs> right? That was I was at the Ashes, so, so that was as British as it gets, I thought. But uh, anyway, excellent, excellent. Um, and did you root yeah, for no, England so or did you root for Australia? I was on the uh, pro England side and Thank like many others loyalty. surrounding me, I had a newspaper and I fell asleep a few times. So, I mean, I was, I was actually turning British. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. <laughs> so, so let's just pick up on, let's just pick up on the cultural side of things, right? So, yeah. We've got off on a tangent there. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, no. So, so can you give us a bit more color on, on, on that? So like, um, you know, give us some examples and, and, what have you yeah. been coaching the, the the clients that you've been working with or the companies you've been working with? What have yep. you, how have you coached them to overcome some of those barriers? So the, the way I've done it is, I, I've again, just going back to the book for a second, I, I've, I've looked at all the mistakes that I've made over the last 15 years or so, right? And, and as I... Um, wrestled through this stuff. And I think, you know, even, even 15 years ago, certainly today, we're all moving at such a fast pace. So it's almost like the mistakes happen, screw ups happen, our relationships get messed up. You try and figure out what's going on, but all of a sudden the next thing's there and you haven't really had a time to sit back and reflect as to what actually just happened. Um, what I did was I, I took that step back and said, okay, what, what are these common mistakes that are happening? And more often than not, what I'm seeing is that there are communication differences across different parts of the world. Uh, for example, the, an easy example would be the American English versus British English communication styles. In fact, when I started looking into it, the highest failure rate of expat assignments is between the UK and the US. Wow. Yeah, that's a that was the percentage easiest. based. Wow. You would think it's the easiest, yeah. and here's, but here's the thing, right? So you'd think it's the easiest because of the language or, or the, 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 the language is the same. The problem, it turns out, is that both sides go in thinking that language is the same thing as working styles and other communication factors. And as you know, you and I, you've worked with a lot of Americans, you know, there's a lot of very different, uh, different components, not only to the language, but how things get done. Yep. Or it's attitudes, what I'll call, we'll call it working styles, how you build relationships, uh, how you communicate, how you give feedback, how you deal with conflict. And I think the problem between the US and the UK, the reason that the failure rate is so high is because people ignore all of that stuff. If, if you or I were to fly off and plant, you know, plant down in Japan, we know that there's some massive differences and that language is a massive barrier. We're almost, almost more at a defensive place where we're kind of thinking about these differences and how can we adjust to it. Um, that almost in a, in a way protects us but that doesn't happen in the U S and the UK. Yep. Yep. And I'll give you, I'll give you another example, which is more on the marketing side since so much uh, marketing has gone to places like the Philippines. I think you and I first met in the Philippines. I was going to bring that up actually. So you're an American yeah. living in, in Singapore. I was yeah. a Brit running a, a global marketing team. So like, um, and I traveled through Singapore, but we actually right. first met in the Philippines, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I've, many um, years I've, ago uh, as well. That was many years ago. I've spent a lot of time there. Uh, and, and many, you know, the part of the 21st century story in the marketing world, sales and marketing world, is that they looked at the Philippines as this uh, fantastic alternative, a lower price market 
uh, where, and, and the Philippines was smart, they laid down some strong fiber optics uh, and they became the back office. They became the call center to English speaking countries in the West. Yep. And the reason they chose the Philippines, there's obviously political things there as well, but there was a language connection. And the feeling was that the language, the accent was more, I'm just gonna say air quotes, it, but, but it was more neutral than the Indian accent. Right. Because the Indians obviously had the, 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 the British background, they had the language as well, but, but it wasn't working. So all this stuff moved to the Philippines. And they thought that because you speak to somebody in Manila and his or her English seems almost exactly the same, this will be fine. Exact same mistake gets made because underneath the language, that's the culture part. That's yeah. the invisible stuff that catches everybody up. And I spend a lot of time coaching teams who are managing people in the Philippines or Philippine teams who are trying to communicate back in the UK or the US because it, in many cases in the last, let's just call it 20 years, a lot of that um, offshoring has failed. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so if we think about the the culture and the language, right? And we, you, you, you mentioned there that uh, um, you've got a background in marketing, right? You've got a background in sales. You've got a background in marketing. I'm a sales you're marketing also, guy. You're also a fund um, um, a, account manager at one stage as well, right? Uh, my first job out of school was working for a bank. And I, that, what I learned there was that I had no interest in ever working for a bank. Uh, so that was a good lesson, right? This Excellent. Was, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and what I did was I very quickly flipped over and went into a startup. The timing was bad. It was the dot-com explosion. So I got, I got a good, good, good time yeah, there. Yeah, I, was, yeah. um, I was a millionaire at the age of 23 on paper for a few months, which was fun. Uh, and then a month later, um, I think I was in debt, you know, student loans and, and everything. And so I took a job uh, basically at a, at a high-end call center. Gotcha. And gotcha. And, and then, a marketing channel ever since. So, so out in Asia Pac, um, I know when we met, you worked for a company called TSL Marketing. You still do, yes. right? You're still there, managing do. director in, uh, in Asia Pacific? Still do. So TSL, a uh, worldwide company, so they do marketing across the planet. Uh, they have evolved like so many other companies. Uh, they started out as a high-end call center, but now they've really adjusted to more of an end-to-end marketing. So they do a lot of digital marketing campaigns for, for clients. What we found was, so I opened the office in, in Singapore, and the plan it, back in tw 2006, this was based on what our clients were telling us, was that they wanted to do more uh, global campaigns, lead generation campaigns worldwide. Yep. And we thought we could do it. And it turned out that both of us were wrong. Uh, it turned out that the clients didn't really know what a global lead gen campaign looked or felt like. And we really wrestled with it here because Asia is not a market, right? There's, yep. I'll just call it 10 markets, but there's way more than that. But, you know, all of a sudden I was supposed to be doing uh, the same type of program that we would might maybe do in the U.S., but I was supposed to do it across six or eight countries with six or eight languages and then the culture and the geographic distance. And it just became much more complicated than both we thought as well as our clients thought. So hopefully I wasn't one of those pain in the backside clients. You were, uh, you, I, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, next question. Reserve judgment. <laughs> <laughs> Moving yeah, on. Thanks. Thanks. So, but picking up on them, right. So, um, you know, culture, language, um, you know, different countries, different markets, different industries, different markets, right. How do you see social media playing a role in shaping the next chapter of digital marketing with the majority of workforce today being at home or remote. Yep. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, what do you see playing out there? Let me, let me um, tweak that question a bit. Let me add digital marketing or social media for B2B companies. Yeah. And the reason B2B. I add yep, that definitely. is because yep. that's my space. I, I, yep. I, I don't, I just don't play in the B2C space. That's, uh, that's my space as well, my friend. There we go. So let's just add that to the mix. Yep. Uh, 
Look, it's, it's in, in my patch, my territory here of Southeast Asia, the answer is complicated. Yeah. Um, I think it's the, so, so it's important, but these different countries seem to have different preferences to social media uh, platforms. Yep. How those communication styles work. I was double checking before we started talking. There was one site that I, I do go to from time to time. I had to write it down to make sure I remembered. Excuse me, smartinsights.com. They measure global social media impact, and, and um, uh, it's a research firm. I, they're still around who they're basically looking at what countries are using what platforms. And one of the things that we wrestled with with clients is they said this, you know, they were saying, look, we want to do a YouTube channel and we want to do a Facebook thing. Okay, in Asia. Well, what's Asia? And um, you know, obviously YouTube doesn't work and Facebook doesn't work in some parts of Asia at all, uh, even though it's used, but the usage is significantly lower. Uh, and so we're talking about China, but we found that YouTube usage varied across countries. We found that Twitter was more popular in some places than others. Facebook was used uh, in some places and not others. So it all of a sudden we looked at, at the geography and it turned into this sort of mess uh, where we couldn't come in and recommend, you know, here's your one answer strategy for this part of the planet. It's just, it's just more fragmented than, um, yeah. than what companies might be used to just in, say, uh, we'll call it Western Europe or, or the U.S. And you, you're seeing the likes of WeChat being uh, yep. uh, widely used in, in your neck of the woods as well, right? Um, yes and no. So WeChat has this incredible ecosystem that works phenomenally well in China. Yep. It's expanding into other regions but that ecosystem that experience is different there uh the interconnectedness of the companies that are involved in that platform vary considerably so it, even you, you still can't you know everybody in china is tied into this thing and it, it does everything for them but wechat in singapore is significantly limited in terms of what you can and can't do with it gotcha as gotcha. of now so, so with social distancing being put in place in, yep. in a number of countries, right? It's like, um, you know, we talked about uh, um, airline restrictions, um, you know, cancelling of, of mass gatherings. Um, how do you see people or, or what do you see happening it's like, um, with regards to people creating meaningful experiences without that, that P2P, that peer-to-peer -peer connection? Let me, so let me address that from more of a, an internal standpoint rather sure. than a customer facing standpoint yeah, as a yeah. starting point. Um, I've looked at, at uh, remote teams for a number of years because yeah. in my line of, I mean, we, I've been doing this now for a long time because I, I, I'm now the only TSL employee in Singapore. It used to be the reverse and now we've got people scattered throughout. So I'm on these types of calls all the time. Right. And one of the things that the researchers have looked at over the last decade or so is a phrase that they call the problem of social distance. So social distance is, this is not a new phrase. This is something that anybody who is dealing with remote teams should be aware of anyway, because social distance is essentially the problem <laughs> of social distance yep. uh, and the fact that people are, are all separated. And, and I'll give you a specific example. So let's say you're doing a group conference call. Social, the, the social dis distance problem is that you may have people joining that call who are, who are together. Let's say that they're in an office together in one part of the world. Well, they might be in the elevator together and they're having a, a chit, chit chat before the thing starts at, in the room. That's, that's just social kind of light bonding. And then the call ends and maybe you're, you're remote and uh, I go, okay, Colin, that sounds great. We'll talk to you later. And we, uh, we hang up the phone and Colin's gone. And I look at the person who's in the room and I go, well, that's not going to happen. Right. Or, you know, you're like, or just like, well, he, he, that guy's crazy if he thinks that's going to happen. Right. And we had a number of those conversations when I was a client. I remember uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he wants he wants that at that price. 
Um, but, but the problem is, is that nobody here, you know, people aren't dumb. And, and when those calls end, they know that there's chit chat going on that they're not always involved in. And this might sound like playground, you know, small kid stuff, but it's not. This is adult problems because those little things get in everybody's heads. What are these people talking about? What don't I, what, what am I missing out on? Right. Uh, and that's where it's silos start. Right. People start telling themselves stories. They start actually creating narratives of here's what's going on there. It, it's, it turns into an us versus them, you know, them against me, whatever that is scenario yep. very yep. quickly. So what, what I, and, and we're, here we are at, uh, in the, you know, towards the end of March, this social distancing is just kicked off in a massive way uh, worldwide. In the next month or two, there's going to be, there will be significant problems with working remotely because teams don't know how to manage this type of social distance challenge. So, so just to summarize that, I mean, really what you're saying is it's all about how do you keep, and we, we're, we're talking internally, so we're talking about yes. staff, associates, team members, yes. but it equally as much applies to clients and to the market in general, right? Agreed. Agreed. This yeah. is um, in terms of like customer relationship management, yep. it's the exact same problem, yep. uh, especially, especially if it's a net new client where that relationship isn't as strong or well established. Yep. So it's how do we keep people informed, educated and engaged, right? So like, and that's, if I were to sum it up in, in, in a nutshell, yep. is, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. And, and uh, you know, what I'm seeing everybody and that you've got every guru, everybody's out, you know, plastering uh, the social media right now with guidance and with advice. Uh, I think that some of it is, is, is actually helpful. A lot of it's overlapping. A lot of us are saying the same things, but yeah. uh, one of the bits of advice is to over communicate. There's a downside. There's a downside to that as well. You, you can very easily over communicate to the point of being annoying. So if you think about it from a brand standpoint or a customer interaction standpoint, people go, you know, you're, you're overdoing it here. Right. Yep. Yeah. So there has to be that kind of that balance. But I, what, what I found, especially in the B2B space, and I don't care if we're talking about internal now or customer facing relationships matter. In a, in a massive way. And I think that it's so much easier to build relationships when you're in a face-to-face -face environment for the foreseeable future that's off the table. Yep. So yep. what can we do to try and, you know, it's not going to be the same, but what can we do to get a little bit better than, uh, than what's currently happening with the social distancing problem that, that I've already talked about? So, so you're you're a big user of of social media yourself, right? I follow you on uh, on on Twitter. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, that, yeah. I'm I'm, I'm kind of new to Twitter. Uh, I'm the only real. So I'm laughing because the only social media I really use is LinkedIn and and Twitter. And Twitter is more on my on the fun stuff. But but yeah, but yes. So that's. I thought you were going to say you're laughing because I'm the only person following you. I think you might be. <laughs> <laughs> but but all I was going to say, right, in, in, in that regards, right, just picking up on, on what you've said there, right, how, um, you know, what advice have you got for people to ensure that, um, you know, when they are posting stuff on, on social um, and it's being read by, you know, by anyone, but you know, yes. hopefully it's being read by customers, by, yes. um, you know, by prospects, how, how do you ensure that it's viewed as relevant rather than spam? Uh, you, I, I think that you ensure, the, it's, a, it's a tough question because it depends on what you're sending out. Uh, right. If you're sending out stuff that you don't believe in or you think is just sort of corporate propaganda and you're just blasting it out to, for the sake of noise, yep. you know, in the long run, you're not doing yourself any favors. There's um, a lot of companies and individuals who I think are guilty of using that uh, you know, uh, when we talk about social media, essentially we're talking about giving a bunch of us a gigantic megaphone. And so you've got a bunch of people now with this megaphone and like any tool, it's incredibly powerful or incredibly dangerous. Uh, I, and that's why, you know, I, I was enjoying the conversation with you guys earlier about how you're measuring, you know, the, the customers that you use and the usage yep. that they're doing to me, the, the long winded answer to your question 
is follow-up engagement from a post. So if you were to send something that you actually do find interesting, I think that the dialogue that comes out of that, that's, that's a human connection, yeah. not just being a one-way you know, shotgun kind of spewing out whatever is forwarded to you. So it's more about sending out something, but then actually having it turn into uh, a dialogue. Uh, I'll give you an example. I, I just wrote an article. I posted it today um, on LinkedIn. And it was a somewhat, I, I think it's a somewhat controversial take on, on the, the idea of VUCA, uh, volatility, uncertainty, uh, what, uh, I should probably know what VUCA stands for. Uh, but so, so the, the idea that I had, and I write about it in this book, is to say, you know, some of the people who I found who handle uncertainty and volatility really well are actually volatile and uncertain themselves. Uh, they're often the troublemakers kind of outside of work. They, they're, they're not the people that are the, you know, clean cut straight shooters all the time. Sometimes, in other words, you need somebody who's got a little, a little VUCA attitude to handle a VUCA situation. Yeah. And so that, that's the article. And, and there's a lot that can be pushed back on that. That to me is right. a really starting point of a, of a discussion because it's that's not a fully in other words that's not a fully baked idea but I'd love to have that kind of as an ongoing conversation so I, I look forward to having that using social media to have that discussion with other people because it gets into the topic that I like which is you know leadership leadership in times of adversity how do you handle uh, quick change situations what have you seen that works what doesn't that's much more authentic than just a one-way shooting out, you know, marketing material. Yeah, and it, it also demonstrates the value that you're bringing to that conversation, right? And therefore, you know, you've got that uh, establishment of an industry thought leader. I, I think, and I think that, the, well, yes, and I think that there's a sincerity to it. And, and as mm -hmm. just from a personal standpoint, it helps me test my ideas. And it, and it you know, when there are people who push back in a constructive way, it makes it makes the ideas tighter. Or I go, yeah, actually, you know what? You got me. I'm going to throw this one out and move on. So, so I've got a, a question for you. Totally changing tack. Is email dead? I don't think so at all. Uh, in a B2B standpoint, I don't think email is dead. I think that um, I think I think that email blasting uh, in the traditional way, the way we've done it in the past, where you just you know, collect as many email addresses as ho and spray and pray, that's dead. Uh, and that should be dead. And we should celebrate. Oh, what do you mean? We've, we've never done that in the past. You Absolutely. Know? We would never, that. never, 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 never dreamt do of doing that. Oh my never, goodness. never do that. I, I think that, um, look, I, I think that B2B is all about, from a marketing standpoint, it's all about using all of these tools that we have at our disposal and testing them. Uh, do, do I think that you want to focus everything on email marketing? Probably not, but I do see a value to it, especially if you've got a, a targeted audience where you are having uh, strong and, and meaningful conversations and ideas that you're sending to them. So, so it's really it, about an integrated um, marketing mix, right? It has to be, it has to be integrated. Um, yeah. The social stuff is important, but... I find at the end of the day, when you want to take a step back, and again, you know, it depends on the systems that you're using, but if I want to know who's my target audience, I still fall back to that email list of, of um, you know, this is my starting point. Yep, yep. But if you, could tie, to... if you could tie all of that together, then that, that's the power, right? That's the secret that's, source. That's yeah. the multiplier. Yep. That's the multiplier yep. of all of this. Uh, no question. Gotcha. No question. So gotcha. Is, it, is it dead? No. What we've been doing in the past should be, should be taken out bat and sh back and shot. Uh, and hopefully it's, it's happening more often because this, you know, we're still getting a bunch of spam. Um, the, the B2B stuff is still, but the, the, the response rates are just so abysmal. Hopefully it'll die out. Uh, but I do think that there's a value uh, of email marketing within the within the bigger mix. No gotcha, question. Gotcha. So, Carl Hegarty, this is your book. This is the book. 
right? It, it comes out when? June, June 2020? This book comes out in June of 2020. Uh, pre-order, you can pre-order it now. And uh, I'm doing, uh, well, I'm spending my time now doing, doing workshops online with teams. So if teams buy this book, just even pre-order it, uh, they, they get to work with me directly. So I'm, I'm a cheap date these days because I'm doing it just for the book sales instead of my usual consulting rates. So this is, Carla, uh, this is I, the time I bought go. the book. I bought the book when we were together last, uh, last time in Singapore, which was September 2019. Yeah. So uh, surely I get a discount for being so like the first person to buy that book or did your grandmother so like, go and buy it before me? You, uh, you also bought the, bought the beers, I think. I did buy so, the beers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think we need to get you, we need to sign you up for a negotiation course. They, uh, perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Um, so, so before we sign off, where can, where can people find more information about you? Where can people find, follow you like, um, socially? You mentioned Twitter. You mentioned LinkedIn. Um, you know, um, go for it. Yep, those are those are the two social media platforms that I'm using. I would think that you know the, the LinkedIn is probably the uh, the more focused in terms of the communication. Link, uh, Twitter is is fun, and I I do you know think that there's some great conversations. This is Twitter is sort of the thing that you send a little bit you know after 5 p.m. just for fun, and 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 that does. I think there's been some great stuff on there, but uh, my website actually for focused on this is called leadershipnomad.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. There's our good old newsletter email list. And that's where the, it's probably the most consistent way to hear the updates. Uh, you can get the details on the book there as well. So yeah, LinkedIn, Twitter, or leadershipnomad.com. What's your Twitter handle? Or don't you know it? I think it's leadership nomad. It is Leadership Nomad. I was testing yeah. you. There you uh, go. I, uh, so, you know what my uh, LinkedIn handle is? Go on. Slapdragons. And, and why Slapdragons? Well, that was the original title of the book. And it came back from a story. This happened years ago. This was a U.S. client. It was not you. Uh, and uh, he was a uh, cloud company. He ran a cloud company out of the U.S. And they were trying to rapidly expand into Asia. Uh, he had never traveled the region. He didn't know anything about Asia. And quite frankly, he wasn't very curious about it. Uh, he was sending me mater marketing material. This is old school. You, you'll love this. Yeah. He was sending me all of his marketing material and it had like baseball imagery on it and everything was in American English. And he goes, look, just blast this out to Asia and we'll start doing some deals that way. And I'm telling him, I'm like, look, you know, people in Singapore and Malaysia, these markets, they don't play baseball. They don't appreciate your spelling. You've got to localize. You've got to think more uh, about what your local audience wants. And he said, listen, just, you know, it's Asia. So just slap a dragon on it and make it Asian. And there's the cultural difference. There's the cultural difference. And I can't tell you the number of companies and people that I've come across, and that truly is what they what they still do, which is let's just slap a dragon on it, and that'll be Asian enough, and uh, that'll work. And it never works, obviously. And that's not just a, a west to east thing; that's happening on the other way as well. So that's you know, eastern companies going into new markets, making making the mistake of thinking that the way they do business is the way business is done the world in the rest of the world. Carl so, Hegarty. Thank you so, so much for your time. I'm going to let you go because uh, I know your family are waiting to take you uh, out to be, dinner. They'll be rushing in at some point, yeah. I, I wanted them to rush in in the background during uh, I did, yeah, during I, that I, chat. I was, it, it was 50-50. You didn't know. You never know. Yeah, no, no, it, it didn't happen. Back. It didn't happen. But, uh, mate, seriously, thank you so much for your time. I'm Colin Day, Managing Director of Octopost EMEA. For more information about Octopost, please visit us at www.oktopost.com. That's www.octopost.com.